All right. <clears throat> so in three, two, one. This is John Carroll again with Forward Talk, and today we are honored to have a special guest with us, Dr. Joel Reveille. Is that how you pronounce your last name? On the money. I'm happy to be here. Awesome, man. Thank you for uh, participating in this uh, interview with us today. And, and just tell uh, people real quick your background in education, what your doctorate is in, and sure. where it's from, and and we will go from there to today's topic. Got it. So I was in college for 10 years. I have a Bachelor of Science, double major from the University of Memphis, double major in physics and mathematics. I have a Master of Science in physics from the University of Michigan and a PhD in physics from the University of Michigan. So my background, I was raised in the apostolic faith, <coughs> but I had not always planned to be a minister. Okay. I wanted to be a scientist, and that was my training. I trained to be a research scientist, and my life plan, if you'd have met me 10 years ago, I would have told you I was planning on being a professor of physics at a university and teaching physics and doing research in biological physics. And my thesis at the University of Michigan was on biological physics, physics of DNA. And I finished that program, and I got my dream job. I was working at St. Jude Children's Hospital here in Memphis, Tennessee. But somewhere in my early days at St. Jude, God began to deal with me that I had what I wanted to have, but I wasn't in the vein that God wanted me to be in. If I'm being honest, I felt the call to ministry when I was a teenager, and my pastor and I even discussed this. I remember this one conversation with Brother Johnson, my pastor, where he asked me, uh, Joel, do you want to take part in the ministry? And I think I answered him, no, I don't. <laughs> and uh, my pastor, he had patience with me. And before he passed away in 2012, I had the opportunity to speak to him and tell him, I do feel called in the ministry. It was one of my last conversations with him, actually. So in 2013, I was ordained as a minister in Auburn Hills, Michigan. I joined the Assemblies of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, in 2014, I'd been working at the hospital for about a year, and I was a minister at that point. I was preaching, and helping my local pastor, and also working the job as a scientist, doing research in the laboratory. And I was doing both for a while, and you can do that. Yeah. As a minister, you have a season where two hands are on the baton, yeah. and you're deciding whether or not you'll take the baton and run that next leg of the race. And God impressed me. It was time to take the time. It's time to answer the call to ministry. May 1st, 2014 was my last day at the hospital. From that day to now, I've traveled full-time and preached. That's amazing. That's an incredible story. And the, uh, <clears throat> the last, uh, no, two interviews ago that I did, I did with a 24-year-old 20, uh, PhD student at the uh, St. Louis University. And so part of the reason why I wanted to have this interview with you is I'm wanting to highlight some of the great um, apostolic academics that we have in, in the movement. I think that's important to uh, put, put that on display and to uh, show what it looks like to be both apostolic and academic at the, at the same time. And so uh, I'm excited about you being here. And for those of you that do not follow Dr. Reveille, please take the opportunity uh, to follow him on uh, Instagram. I know you're on Instagram. Are you on any other uh, social media? Twitter formats? and Facebook. Twitter and Facebook. We will look up those social media handles. We'll put them on the screen for our followers to be able to uh, to, to go connect to you on social media, to, to follow your ministry and the things that, that you have to say. <clears throat> so as Let me we say this about uh, academics before we move forward here for a moment. Okay. That I know there'll be pastors who are watching this who have teenagers in their congregation who are considering different options to go to Bible college, to go to community college, to go to a university that could be several miles, several hours away. Let me speak this to you. Academics is not going to bring someone out of the plan of God if they're truly seeking God with an honest heart. 
if I'm thinking through the people I've met and the encounters and conversations I had in college, I honestly can't tell you very many stories where someone got to college and was argued out of belief in God by a professor yeah. or by a class. Normally the procedure was that person got to college and joined Greek life or a fraternity. Okay. And it was more of a sinful temptation. It wasn't an academic argument that they said, well, this word of this verse in the book of Romans has convinced me not to believe Acts 238. No, it was yeah. a sinful temptation. And honestly, my own story in college, my first year, my freshman year at the University of Memphis was the first year that I read the Bible through, cover to cover. Oh, wow, that's an incredible. So when my friends had questions and were figuring out who they wanted to be, I in the dorm was reading in Genesis and through the Gospels and the New Testament and the Old Testament. And that was the beginning of my deep relationship with God. So if you want to know the secret to having a young man or a young lady go deeper with God in college, encourage them to open the Bible for the first time. Start that relationship with Scripture when they're beginning that first step of adulthood. Say, this is the time for you to open the Word of God for yourself. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. And when I uh, approached you about doing this interview, I, was, I told you that I was in a science class, and it's mm -hmm. uh, right now. It's called The Origin of the Cosmos. I'm in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's part of a theology degree that I'm working on at Regent University. And so uh, <clears throat> we have been, we've been talking about <clears throat> cosmology, both from an ancient Near East perspective, um, as well as a uh, cosmological perspective and kind of <clears throat> also <clears throat> connecting what um, theologians throughout church history has done in responding to uh, cosmological ad advances and, and that sort of thing. And so not only we're we talking about cosmology, we're also talking about um, evolution and things of that nature in the class. Now, the, the class, uh, the, the position of the class is that is one of, uh, of old earth theistic uh, mm -hmm. evolution. And so it holds a view of the earth is 13.7 billion years old, or the universe, the cosmos is 13.7 mm -hmm. billion years old. Um, the, the earth is around four to 5 billion um, <clears throat> years old. And uh, that evolution is the, the mechanism by which God has uh, brought about life as we know it, et cetera. And so uh, as a physicist, we want, I want to ask you a few questions on the cosmological side of, um, of the issue. And then we will, move into the evolution side sure. of, of the conversation to pick that up. And I know because you did your, uh, uh, your focus with your, uh, your physics degree was biological physics and you did that's your right. PhD thesis on um, DNA. So that's going to play perfectly into the uh, evolution aspect of it as we go into the second part of the conversation. But first of all, uh, I, I already know what your position is, but I want you to tell the audience what your view is on the age of the universe, the age of, of uh, our planet, our solar system, et cetera. Sure, sure. To answer the question, I want to start from a sola scriptura standpoint. Sure. We are apostolic. Yes. Our measuring line is this book right here. I brought my Bible for this meeting. And so... To begin the answer, I'm going to read a verse from 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Okay, so the heavens were of old. In my interpretation, I do not believe in a young or a recent creation. I believe the heavens really were of old, that the earth is several billion years old and the universe is 13.7 billion years of age. And that is not inconsistent with scripture. I wanna make this very clear. We must distinguish as apostolics between 
biblical statements and interpretation of biblical statements. Acts 2.38 is a biblical statement. 1 Corinthians yeah. chapter 11 is a biblical statement. The earth being 6,000 years old, you're not going to find that verse in the book of Genesis. There is um, no text in Genesis that tells you how long ago the earth was created. Yes. What you have are the following. You have genealogies. Okay. So you have the exact number of years between, say, time of Christ and right now. You have the exact number of years between the carrying away to Babylon and the ministry of Jesus. You have the exact number of years, say, between King Solomon and all the kings of the Old Testament all the way down to Zedekiah during the carrying away to Babylon. You have the exact number of years from Moses to that point. So we're leapfrogging through time here. Solomon tells you the number of years when he dedicates the temple between Moses and the Exodus, the dedication of the temple. And you have the exact number of years during the sojourning in Egypt from Abraham to Moses. So we leapfrog right there from present day back to Jesus, to the carrying away to Babylon, to King Solomon, to Moses, to Abraham. All of those are exact scriptural statements. Yeah. When you start going back farther than Abraham, it gets tricky because what you have are names mm. and genealogies. So if you will indulge me, allow me to throw a monkey wrench in those time calculations. Okay. So in the genealogy of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 11, between Noah and Abraham, you have the following genealogy. Noah, Shem, Arphaxad, and Salah, I think are the four names, all right, in Genesis chapter 11. Okay. Those four names are in order. But when you look at Luke chapter 3 in the genealogy of Jesus, you have that exact same genealogy repeated. And it doesn't have the exact same list. It has... Noah, Shem, Arphaxad, Canaan, Salah. There's an extra name in the genealogy. Okay. So if we're going to interpret the genealogies, we must approach this with the following understanding. It is possible that there are names in between. Okay. It's possible that you're also reading highlights. Okay. You're reading an exact list from Adam and to Noah and from Noah into Abraham, but there may be additional names. I got you. The Bible doesn't tell you the exact number of years from Adam to Noah. It doesn't tell you the exact number of years from Noah to Abraham. That's an interpretation. And as an interpretation, understand that approaching scripture. And we should not make that the same type of pillar as we would the 400 years they were in Egypt. I got you. That makes sense. So the, the, the follow-up question to that is then, uh, what, what do you think is the age of man? How long has man been on the earth? Obviously, I don't think, uh, I don't think people are going to say that man has been here the 4.5 billion years of the planet earth. So the how, first answer will be a scientific one. It'll okay. be that you have cave drawing paintings. If you want to date how long man has been on the earth, you can do it two ways. Scientifically, you can look at farming evidence. And the other part is the art and drawings. The art and drawings would be in the tens of thousands of years. But again, that'd be an interpretation. The number of years, the dating techniques for the cave drawings are not 100% well nailed down. It's yeah. a, we think it's about this amount of time. Yeah. So. Biblically, we know so, the first man was Adam. The question is, from Adam to now, what's the exact amount of time? So, so you would have, it's feasible to say that we have an old cosmos, an old mm -hmm. creation, and a recent anthropology, yes. a recent humanity. So an old earth, a young man. Exactly. Man has been on the earth for thousands of years. Yes. But the earth has been around for millions and billions. Yes. So, okay. okay. Genesis chapter one tells you something like this too, all right? Let's dig into this here. So, let's justify this in the Bible right now. I gave you scientific data. Now, let's go in our biblical data in the Word of God. Genesis chapter one, and verse number one. We all know this verse. It says the following In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Full stop. 
in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The heaven, that's everything, space, stars, galaxies, superclusters, black holes, galactic filaments, everything out there is there in verse one of Genesis. Yes. It's already there, including the earth and the solar system. So what you read from that point on is focused on the creation of the earth, of things going on in the atmosphere, of okay. things going on in the sky, of the sea, of the land, of birds, of plants and seedlings, of trees, of whales, of beasts, and of man. From there, the focus of the discussion is the earth, but everything that it was in the universe is already there from the verse one of the Bible, when it speaks that in the beginning God created the heaven, everything out there, and the earth. And it doesn't say necessarily how long the heavens and earth were there, verse one, or the heavens was there in verse one, until Correct. the work began to to happen in the in the formation and the development of the earth and the things that are in the earth. So we we don't know how long it would have exactly. been. So, so speak the word to yom. You. So in, in Hebrew, the word yom is day, yeah. and the word yom and day for the six days of, or seven days of creation. That same word yom is used in I think Genesis chapter two and verse four to describe all seven days. Exactly. So, so Not in the first couple chapters scholar. of Genesis, the word yom is used in like at least three different three different ways. And so so the question then is how do we determine then that the earth is or the cosmos is thirteen point seven uh, billion years old? For most young earth creationists, fundamentalist, evangelical, or Pentecostal or whatever form you put on that, that just feels like a capitulation to to um uh, to the Big Bang Theory, which we all perceive as being this atheistic agenda to, to uh, dis discredit Scripture, discredit God, uh, which is not the case. We can talk about that in a moment. But So what is, the, what is the reason why that we know that uh, the Earth is 13.7 billion years old as opposed to 10 to 13,000? Um, as a lot of young earth creationists suppose astrophysical measurements so, so measuring the distances distances of galaxies and the speeds they're moving away there's something called the hubble constant it's yeah. a very well measured number and uh, the hubble constant basically tells you we know that there are galaxies that are very far distant away we, there's a way of measuring that distance and we can measure the speed that they're moving away from us and for measurements of the speeds versus the distance, there's a number that pops out of that calculation. And that number is if you rewind, so to speak, that uh, tape, then what you see is everything begins to get smaller, 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 smaller. So there is more like a the universe is no older than this number. Okay. Now, personally, I do not believe in the Big Bang. Yeah. The Big Bang never happened. Um, the best argument against the Big Bang was given to me by a Hindu professor, <laughs> of all people. God will bring people to you who will give you the arguments against atheism and against naturalistic phenomena. So one day a professor told me, he said, this, this never happened. Big Bang never happened. And here's why in physics. When you crunch matter into a small enough space, it becomes what is termed a black hole. Anything that is crunched below a certain limit, in technical terms, the source chill radius, but a small limit, a small density of space, oh. and that matter becomes a black hole. If you crunch all of the matter in the universe into a small enough space, then the entire universe collapses in on itself and becomes a black hole through which light cannot even escape. So if you really believe that the universe was infinitesimally small and then expanded, you must explain how the universe in a black hole state would have blown up to the size it was. And the answer is there is no theory of physics that can give you that. That is cartoons. That is just so stories. It's fiction. It is atheistic dogma. It never happened. I got you. So, so, in other words, the argument for the age of the universe 
is that we know that there are planets that it takes the light from those galaxies, mm-hmm. those planets, those stars, uh, light from stars and galaxies, millions of years to reach us. Mm. So if, if the universe was only say 10,000 years old, then how come it takes the light, what we know about the speed of light to, to take millions of years to, to get to us. Obviously if you can observe the, there. If you can observe the night sky in a place where there are no city lights, mm-hmm. it's possible to see a decent view of the Milky Way stars. Okay? Yes. Most of those stars are tens of thousands of light years away. Yeah. The Milky Way galaxy itself is about a hundred thousand light years across, and other distant galaxies that we can observe through the Hubble Space Telescope mm-hmm. or even ground land telescopes on the tops of mountains can be millions of light years away. That means light was traveling for over a million years to reach that telescope lens. Yes. So we know these things are out there, and they're part of the creative work of God. Again. Going back, if we are truly sola scriptura, if we're truly basing our belief on the Bible, can you show me where this book says how old the the universe? universe, Yes, the universe is only six thousand years old. That's an interpretation, and it's not. Am I am I correct that we can even see? There's places that you can even see Andromeda from with the naked eye. If you know what you're doing with a telescope, (laughs) I got you. I got you. And so, so then the problem, the, the typical response to the, the light distance problem is that God created the universe with the appearance of, of age and maturity. Just like when he created Adam, Adam wasn't an infant baby. When he created Adam, created Adam as a full-grown, mature, appearing mm-hmm. Uh, human he was seconds old but he appeared to be much older than what he actually was in terms of of how he was the size that adam was his physical development and all of that it would have taken much longer than one second to get to that size under normal circumstances and so uh, many young earth creationists try to apply that principle to uh, what appears to be an aged cosmos that just like God created Adam with the appearance of age that uh, why couldn't he have created the the cosmos with that same appearance of age and of course I heard one young earth creation say the reason why the planets are so the galaxies and the stars are so far apart is that God stretched out the heavens and so it was a uh, sort of a, a, a miraculous thing that God uh, made the heavens large. He stretched them out that they're, they didn't actually uh, expand to be that far apart by just natural process. So I don't remember the exact quotation of how God stretched out the heavens, but I know that was a quotation from the Bible. That'd be more a quotation that I would apply to the theory of the expanding universe. We know from physics the universe is expanding, yeah. and that would be yet another biblical confirmation of something we have only recently observed in science in the last uh, 50 or 60 years. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, about the last century, I'm being honest. But again, it's going to sound like I'm beating a dead horse here with this argument, yeah. but show me in Genesis where it says that God created all these animals fully formed, already you know, in full-grown adulthood as they already are. If we are truly apostolic and garner all of our beliefs from the Bible, it doesn't make that statement in Genesis. Yes. Again, it's okay. interpretation. The book of Genesis tells you an outline. So thousands of years of history are covered in 11 chapters. 11 chapters gets you from in the beginning to Abraham left Ur. Yeah, so sure. it's, it's a quick summary and outline of everything from the Tower of Babel to Cain and Abel to the serpent in the garden to uh, people doing uh, this genealogy and uh, Adam, Shem, Noah, everything. The Great Flood, men were violent, giants. It's 11 chapters of the Bible has a huge outline of history. 
So don't assume you're getting 100% of everything that ever happened in the entire universe in 11 chapters. Yeah. You're getting the broad strokes. This was God interacting with man. God was not being an accountant in the first 11 chapters. God was being a deity in relationship with his creations. He wanted to get to the important stuff to him, which was his relationship with us. Absolutely. And so, and so there is no theological need to say that the earth is six to 10 or 13,000 years old, yeah. a recent creation. There's no theological yeah. need to say that. There is, uh, you have to come to scripture with a mm. young earth presupposition. Mm. There's nothing in any text, yeah. in any biblical text that informs me that the earth is only we'll just use 10,000 years old. Mm -hmm. The cosmos is only 10,000 years old. There's, there's no biblical text that addresses the age of the universe. So it's exactly. unnecessary to place this tension between scripture and, and cosmology. Exactly. And doesn't it expand our view of God to consider that there's a lot that he's been doing that he <laughs> doesn't give us all the details about. Yeah, I think absolutely. God is working all the time and he doesn't tell us what he's up to. <laughs> and to me, and to me the, the bigger the universe, the bigger the cosmos, the bigger the glory of God, the greater the, the grandeur, grandeur of the creator. And so I honestly Amen. do not see a conflict between uh, Amen. Uh, accepted understanding of, of uh, the age of the universe based upon cosmology and what the Bible teaches us about um, the, heavens, the heavens and the earth. Amen. A couple of points here, because I know what, what the responses are going to be. You're going to get like uh, 50 responses on carbon dating when I have this video with you here. So <laughs> carbon dating can give you dates in the tens of thousands of years. Carbon dating is not how the Earth is dated. When astronauts went to the moon, they picked up moon rocks that were a few billion years old. Also, we have ways of dating the Earth that don't involve moon rocks. But we can do uranium dating. So if you assume that uh, uranium of different isotopes was all generated at the same time and arrived at Earth in, a, in the same period, you can take ratios and then from the half-lives of uranium arrive at a date of the Earth of about three and a half billion years. Okay. That's actually a problem I had in graduate school, a problem in the sense that that was a homework problem I was given one day, that if uranium was at 238 was this frequency and uranium 235 and that is in this abundance in the Earth, then take the ratio and when was all the uranium made? And the answer was three and a half billion years ago. So there's a few ways of arriving at the age of the earth that are purely rigorous and scientific. And in fact, if you just Google the Wikipedia article on radiometric dating, you'll find that carbon dating is only one technique among about 12 or 20 different radiometric dating techniques, most of which can tell you dates in the millions of years. Interesting. So, uh, so at this point, let's shift to uh, the topic of evolution mm -hmm. and talk briefly uh, about why you think that evolution is a farce. Before we, uh, before we do that, uh, I want to uh, insert a, a poll here for our, our listeners, our, sure. our viewers to participate in. It will appear when the video is uploaded somewhere up here. Uh, I would like for all of you that are watching the video to take the opportunity to participate in this poll and uh, tell us whether or not you are a old earth creationist, a young earth creationist, or let's put a third option in there, uh, a old earth theistic evolutionist. Mm -hmm. And so that poll will probably appear somewhere right up here. Please take the opportunity to participate uh, in that poll. Uh, and kind of be interesting to see what the uh, sure. the consensus of our audience our audience is. Also, let me say too, me as a, as a minister, that I I'm not offended if you disagree with me. But if you feel a young Earth interpretation of the Bible, or if you feel something different from the Scriptures back up what you're saying, this is not in the same basket for me as Acts two thirty eight or oh, spiritual no. gifts. So uh, that's, that's exactly right. I did a, a, a poll between, with the options between young earth creationism and old earth creationism on my Twitter account the last couple of days. And um, so far, 
32 votes. I don't, I don't think you can see it that well. 32 votes and 63% of the people who follow me on Twitter and that's responded to this poll are young earth creationists. 37% of them are old earth creationists. So we will see what, what, what that will, yeah, see what that will play out with when we put this uh, poll here in this, in this video. And um, let's do a second poll. I'm going to do a second poll option here uh, uh, to ask, has Dr. Reveille, uh challenged or maybe uh, caused you to second guess your view of the age of, of creation? And that can be simply a yes or no answer to, to that poll. All right, so let's talk about um, let's talk about evolution. Let's talk about um, as a biophysicist sure. what the what you think the uh, data says about um, about evolution. All right, here's going to be something that I imagine everyone listening can agree with me on. I do not believe that evolution happened, and the short answer is I don't believe in evolution because I do believe in math. Okay. And mathematics and science and the Word of God all agree that this did not happen. Beginning with the Word of God. So I told you in the previous segment the reason I was not a young earth creationist was because I don't feel like the book of Genesis backs that up. The reason I don't believe in evolution is also because the book of Genesis does not back this up. The book of Genesis does not tell you the Lord made several intermediary forms before he made the final form of man, his penultimate creation, it doesn't tell you that. It doesn't even tell you he made several imperfect horses before he made the final penultimate horse. Yeah. This is not what the Bible says. So it's a theological problem to begin with. Our issue is that if we are truly biblical, the Bible does not support evolution. Okay, now moving from the Bible theology to mathematics. Evolution does not agree with the, so I'll explain this. Working in DNA, DNA orders the production of enzymes and all the different components of man, all right? DNA orders all the production of enzymes, proteins, everything from bones and components of cells to uh, hormones and everything running around in your blood right now, right? So to have an, a mutation in DNA, will generate a different version of that enzyme. For evolution to be true, you have to have mutations in DNA that generate changes in the body, and those changes will manifest as a new organ, or a new appendage, or a new body plan, or a new appearance. Uh, so an evolutionary biologist would tell you they think that mutations in DNA brought chimpanzees into Neanderthals, into human beings. Yeah. Um, the basic issue with that is math doesn't agree with that. So being a scientist, we can measure mutation rates. That's the long-term experiment running at the Michigan State University where a professor there attempted to coax bacteria into an evolving uh, new enzymes and evolving new pathway enzymes. So we can measure mutation rates of DNA. And those measured mutation rates don't get you new enzymes, new proteins. A few mutations in a million years, or a million is wrong, a few mutations even in a billion years would be what you get in major enzymes. You don't get changes in DNA that can take you from an amoeba to even a mollusk, much less a man. Yeah. So the mathematics, the probabilities, the statistics, the mutation rates don't give you something on the order of a human being as complicated as we are. And even if you get new enzymes, the other problem is symbiosis. So, uh, so man, if you took any biology in college or even if you took high school biology, you probably learned that in your digestive system, there are bacteria. There are bacteria that help you digest. You have a symbiotic relationship with what's called gut bacteria, all right? Yes. And so there are organisms that are there working with you. And so that happens all across the animal kingdom and all across different kingdoms in biology. 
there are symbiotic organisms. And so if you explain the evolution, even if you can find some hand wavy explanation for evolution of one organism, you have to explain all the symbiotic um, the relationships between other organisms and how they co-evolve. And by that point, you're just kind of grasping at straws. I and if you it. do ask an evolutionary biologist, explain to me the exact order and the exact mutations that happen to get you from here to here. Most times the answer is going to be, we can't give you the evolutionary pressures that did this. Wow, that's interesting. In essence, it's fiction. If you, if you can't, how can you make such dogmatic claims about it then? Because they would say they, we have snapshots and we have little pictures in time from the fossil record. So, mm -hmm. okay, let's the fossil record now. So, next piece of evidence, the fossil record does not show you evolution. The fossil record actually is the greatest piece of evidence for creation because the fossil record does not show you evolution. The fossil record shows you long periods of time where the same organism existed and then inexplicably, a new one appears. So you don't have that transitional, yeah. that uh, evolution, that, that tweener form. You have yes. uh, a very quick, uh, sudden appearance of a new species. Discrete jumps from here to here. And we're talking about just body plans can be radically different. I'm a observable new novel organs and new appendages, functions for those appendages. And you must explain not just, it's not just a finch beak change like Charles Darwin observed on the Galapagos Islands. We're talking about differences in the appearances of feet, differences in appendages. And uh, most times in the same kingdom, in the same phylum, but still a radically different appearance of an organism something that cannot be explained by mutations in DNA. There's not enough time elapsed to get from point A to point B. Give it all the time you want. Give it billions of years. It's not going to happen. Give it billions upon billions of years. It just doesn't happen. That's, that, that's awesome. And so, in, in other words, our theology, a biblical anthropology, and a, uh, uh, a scientific uh, approach agrees that that's not possible theologically we say god starts with man mm -hmm. that, that man comes into being by the special creation of god sure. um, Im Im immediately fully formed as we as we are now as humans and absolutely uh, there's no obviously no biblical evidence that man evolved from some lower uh form uh, and you're saying that the the story of DNA, the story that DNA tells us, tells us that man did not come from some some other form or species of, of, of... Yes. So, okay, let me explain this with the science. So man, we know that you have DNA that is very similar to other organisms. So evolutionary biologists will use that DNA and that commonality to argue, oh, you have the same DNA in common because you evolved from a common ancestor. Okay. That argument is fallacious because the same exact evidence can be used to say you have the same DNA in common because you were all designed by the same yeah. creator. Yes, sir. So Absolutely. philosophically, the argument does not hold water. You have about 99.7% DNA in common with a chimpanzee. You also have about 40% DNA in common with a potato, okay? <laughs> so it's, the argument is not what they think it is. It's not an argument of they all have a common ancestor. It's so an they, argument they of all God have a left his... Common creator. Yeah, exactly. God left his fingerprints on us. He left a creation signature that I made all this and I made you. Exactly. Well, man... Uh... I appreciate you so much for taking the time to come talk with me today. And uh, those of you that are watching, if you do not yet subscribe to uh, Forward Talk, please take the opportunity right now to hit that subscribe button. Also hit the notification bell so that you will be notified whenever uh, new episodes are uploaded of Forward Talk. Dr. Revely, thank you for your time today. Thank you for talking time. to us on this topic. I'm sorry uh, that we can't talk further. There's a couple reasons. Uh, 
my battery is about to go dead on my computer. <laughs> and so we will have to take the opportunity to do this again at some point in the future. Also, go, go follow Dr. Reveille on his social media. Uh, pastors out there that uh, are looking for uh, a great preacher to come speak at your church, please uh, contact Dr. Reveille. He will be happy to come speak at your church on, I'm sure, these topics as well as just general gospel preaching um, he will he will do an excellent job and bless your church. So uh, this has been an honor and privilege for me too to be with you. And so the invitation. as our theme here is at Forward Talk, thank you for joining us today in reversing the silence with Forward Talk. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you, my friend.